How you doing this morning? Good. Looking forward to this. I missed you. Good to see you again. Um, I uh, I brought a couple of ropes with me this morning because I thought you might guys you guys might want to see a rope trick or two, maybe me capture somebody with Valeria and that kind of thing. You want to see that? Um, now I want to tell you, I'm not a rope trick guy. I don't do this like all the time and I can't jump through it and all that stuff, but there's a couple of things I do that you can't. <laughs> so <laughs> you'll be impressed a little bit, um, I hope. Um, I'll, uh, you guys can hear me if I guitar real loud from here. Yeah. 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 This is a lariat that, uh, that I used to use in competition and I just sort of cut it down, made the Honda, that's what this little knot here is called, made the Honda a little bit smaller so it wouldn't slide through my hand, and I'm just going to do a couple of things, so you guys can kind of see that the cowboy deal is legit. Almost! Give me another shot at it. I used to be able to just really jump into it and all that stuff, but my knees have turned me into a white man with a two-inch vertical leap, so <laughs> it doesn't work anymore. But after Tuesday, yeah, and months of rehab. <laughs> Thank you. 
try to get your boyfriend through this without being damaged. <laughs> All right, dude. Go, Go. probably go to church with, with a bunch of folks like this that are uh, all right preacher I'm here this morning you got an hour bless me man listen they're not they're not looking to be ministered to they're just trying to put their time in for God you know if I give God an hour of my week surely you know that'll take care of my church responsibilities Man, it isn't about that. See, when you accept Christ, He's baked into you like a biscuit. You know? Your mom makes biscuits, and I don't know exactly how that happens. I'm going to have a bunch of cooks and housewives and mamas laugh at me here, but, you know, you take that flour and milk and salt and butter or whatever else you put in there, and you mix that stuff all up, and you put all those ingredients together, and it makes dough, and you cut those out and you put it in the oven. And once you put that thing in the oven, you can't go in there and take those ingredients out. Once you've had Jesus put into you, once you've accepted Christ and He lives in your heart, you can't take those ingredients out. You can't say, "All right, Lord, uh, you know I'm going to go. I'm going to go to this place where there won't be any Christians there, or there won't be, it, it, or there might be like me. It might be undercover. I'm going to slide in there. I'm going to kind of." You know, act cool and do my thing, say things that would grieve you, and you know, act ways that would that would grieve you. I'm sorry, you can't take the ingredients out. They're baked into you. So um, I'm encouraging you, man. When you get a hold of Jesus, you haven't gotten a hold of a good thing. You've gotten a hold of the best thing. And uh, so I'm gonna do some songs with you, okay? So stand to your feet. How many of you have ever heard uh, Because of Your Love? Not, don't everybody jump at once now. Okay. A couple of you have. You're going to have to sing for the rest of the 260 of us. This is the way this thing goes. Start like this. Yeah. singing a song for you. Okay? So, try to play a little bit more attention, okay? Not hard, easy. Let's do it again. Yeah, yeah, as we come to your 
presence. There we go. Remember every prayer we sing that you poured out so freely from above. Lifting gratitude and praises for compassion so amazing. Lord, we come to give you thanks for all you've done. Because of your love. Because of your love, you're forgiven. Because of your love, our hearts are relieved. We lift you up with songs of freedom. Forever we're changed because of your love. That's not bad. Still kind of staring at me like a cat on a new gate. Because of your love, we're forgiven. Say it. Because of your love, our hearts are clean. And we lift you up with songs of freedom. Forever we're changed because of your love. Yeah, 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 yeah. How about this? You know this one, above all? Y'all got that?
shows and stuff, they got their they got their gun and they'll say to the party, you know, we're going in. Cover me. That's the way we gotta be with uh, with our Heavenly Father. I'm going in, Lord. Cover me. That's the name of this song. I am 
that my weed His heart is always strong So I'm back on my knees The only way I can make a stand I'm going in to cover me It's so afraid of what I can't see That ain't the way it's supposed to be When you're really there
there's a rainbow above you. You better let somebody love you. Let somebody love you. You better let my Jesus love you. best-selling book in America. And people have tried to destroy it. Hitler tried to blow it up, burn it all, and where he printed his propaganda is where they print Bibles. <laughs> A bunch of them. Isn't that cool? So it was just like the Lord saying, little pimple, I'm not worried about you. You don't intimidate me at all. Nothing that you've done I haven't allowed. Pretty cool. That's the God we serve. So let's read this together. Well, let me read it and you listen. <clears throat> Moses commanded Joshua, choose some men to go out and fight the army of Amalek for us. Tomorrow, I will stand at the top of the hill holding the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did what Moses commanded and fought the army of Amalek. Meanwhile, Moses, Aaron, and Hur climbed to the top of the nearby hill. As long as Moses held up the staff in his hand, the Israelites had the advantage. But whenever he dropped his hand, the Amalekites gained the advantage. Moses' arms soon became so tired he could no longer hold them up. So Aaron and Hur found a stone for him to sit on. Furniture movers is what they were. They stood on each side of Moses, holding up his hands. So his hands held steady until sunset. As a result, Joshua overwhelmed the army of Amalek in the battle. <coughs> now, I know you guys don't do this much and you're never called to do that, but if that is a very cool story, I want you to say amen. amen. And, and I'm going to try to help maybe explain to us how cool that is. All right? You know, Moses was a shepherd, and, and I'm, I'm a cowboy. Shepherds <clears throat> lead sheep. You can't drive sheep anywhere. <clears throat> sheep are so stupid that when you drive 
a herd of sheep. If you drive cattle, you know, if you've got a good fence, one cowboy can drive, oh man, 150 head of cows down the fence. And if one cow goes that way, they're all going to go, hey, he's going that way. I'm going. You know, that's what cows do. If you get behind sheep and you go, ha, ah, sheep go, and boom. They go every way, every way but the right way. They're going to jump over you, you know. Oh man, I got lost last night and, you know, jumping the bed. Ah, it's crazy. Sheep don't, you can't drive sheep. You have to lead sheep. And here's something that really kind of aggravates me, but it's so true. Jesus akins himself to a shepherd. You know what we are? We're just dumb sheep. I mean, listen, dumb as a rock sheep. But it's easy to follow a shepherd who is always looking out for us, always taking care of us, always protecting us, always saving us when we fall down over the edge of a cliff or when we take the wrong step or when we make the wrong decision, always willing and able to pull us back to himself. Kind of straighten us up, straighten our tie, and smooth out the wrinkles. And say, okay, you ready? Now don't stray again. Here we go. And we follow again. To be a shepherd, you got to have a staff, okay? So I'm going to tell you maybe a little story found in Exodus 4 where God changed the staff that belonged to Moses and he changed it into something that would really be available to Moses through the rest of his ministry and the rest of his career as a leader of Israel. When Moses was getting ready to go help the children of Israel get out of Egyptian bondage, God called him and said, Moses, how come you don't want to do what I, oh Lord, listen, I can't, oh, I'm not the guy. I'm a murderer. I killed a man. I'm wanted in Egypt. I go walking back in there. They're going to arrest me, throw me in jail. They had a posse out looking for me for a long time. I had to just split. I've been in the, I've been in the wilderness for 40 years. I've, I've, been, I've been an outcast. And God said to Moses, what is that in your hand? And Moses goes, what? Oh, oh, it's a stick. And he said, throw it on the ground. Now, Moses went out into the woods and he found that stick when he was just a kid. And he cut all the bark off of it. I mean, that thing, what, eight to ten feet long? That's what a shepherd's staff is. It, it's, and they use that thing for a number of deals. They spin it around and, and buddy, it's a weapon. They drive off the coyotes and the wolves and, and the bear. <laughs> And, and they can use that thing as a weapon. They use that thing to count the sheep as they're coming into the fold. You know? If you've ever stood at a gate, you probably haven't, and that's okay. No big deal. And try to count cows. Or you're trying to count people for Sunday morning service. Poor Deacon, he's up there. People get to moving around and stuff. It's like, oh man, 150 foot. Oh, I can start all over now. One. <laughs> If you want to count cows or sheep or whatever, put something up, and as they go by, it's a lot easier to count. They use that staff for that. It's kind of like a graph staff. That's mathematical, isn't it? That's all I know. And they, they take and spin it around and take the other end, and they have wrapped it around something, you know? Just like when a guy's trying to train a ball glove. He takes a baseball and puts it in there, or he takes a softball and puts it in there, and he folds that glove over it. He may wrap that glove up, and he's oiled that thing. He wants it. He wants to train it. Okay? They train those staffs, so they got a crook in it, so they can reach down over the edge of a hill and take a lamb, just sort of hook it under its front legs and pull that lamb to safety. So that staff does a number of things, and God asked Moses to throw it on the ground. And when he threw it on the ground, the Bible says it became a snake. 
Now it doesn't say this, but if Scott was part of that scenario, and, and God said to me, Scott, throw it on the ground. And I threw it on the ground, and it became a snake. My next move would be, ah! <laughs> I don't like snakes. I don't like rubber snakes. I don't like pictures of snakes. I watch the National Ge Geographic Channel, and they're showing those big old anacondas and stuff like that, and my feet are up in the couch. Just so, just suppose one was under the couch. He ain't going to get me. Not going to get my legs. You know, it's kind of like seeing the boogeyman at night. What's the first thing we do? We pull the covers over our head. <laughs> no, Whew. I'm invisible now. <laughs> I'm, I'm in camouflage. Don't breathe. <laughs> so, he wouldn't have had to tell me this. The next thing he says to Moses, well, first thing he says, Moses, come back, come back here. Come, come here, come back. I want you to pick it up by the tail. Lord wouldn't have to tell me that. I'm not going to pick it up by the bitey end. I'm going to pick it up by the tail end. Okay? And Moses picked it up by the tail. That thing became a staff again. It became a stick again. Now something happened when Moses threw down the stick. And it's just like what happens when God asks us to throw down parts of our life that we're really accustomed to. We really like hanging on to. We really like Maybe it's a sin, the Bible talks about, that so easily besets us. And man, we've repented of a bunch of things except that. Because it's easy to go back to. It's easy to be comfortable again with that sin that easily besets us. But when Moses threw it down, it was Moses' stick. And when he picked it up, it became God's stick. And Moses said, Joshua, we're going to have to mix it up with Amalek. I want you to pick some of our, our best fighters, and tomorrow you're going to go to war. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to climb this hill, and I'm going to watch over the battle. And here's what he said. I'm going to take the rod of God, not Moses' stick. I'm going to take the rod of God, and I'm going to hold my hands up, and when my hands are up, you guys are going to win. Now Moses didn't think through this very good because if you just hold your hands up without the weight of a staff in your hand, without the weight of a 10 foot stick in your hand, I don't care how bad you are, pretty soon those arms are going to be going <laughs> and you're going to be going, no, come on. <laughs> it's like when you guys are lifting weights in the bench press and the guy spotting you has an evil mind. And you're going, I can't, I can't get it. He's going, come on, man, come on. Come on, you can do it, you can do it. That thing started toward your neck. Help me, help me. Come on, push, push. And then he takes a hold of it and he doesn't go, oh, help me, man. He goes, he goes, and that little bit of change is going, you're squirming. There are noises coming out of your body in certain places. You're thinking, like, oh, help man, help. <laughs> and your friend's just looking over the top of you like, you're such a wiener, man. <laughs> and he takes that weight and whew, he puts it up and you're just like, oh, I'm going to kill you. As soon as I can breathe, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and so Moses climbs the hill. Aaron and her go up the hill with him. Aaron and her know, they don't know how it's going to happen, but they know that they're going to have to help Moses somehow. Moses stands over the battle and he's got his arms out and all the time that his hands are up, the Israelites are whipping the Amalekites like crazy. Then when he starts getting weak, and his hands are starting to fall. He's trying to hold his hands up. He just can't do it. The Amalekites turn the tide. They start wearing out the Israelites. You know, a few weeks ago I was reading this passage of Scripture, and here's what struck me. Moses wasn't in a spiritual weakness, was he? Moses wasn't hurting in his heart from a spiritual problem that he was having. 
Moses was hurting physically, wasn't he? He couldn't hold his hands up anymore. And it had to be grieving him when those hands started falling and his army was losing. It was tearing him up. I bet he was tearing. Guys, I'm trying. Thank you, I'm trying. I'm trying to do better. And Aaron and Hur said, this is where we step in and we help Moses. They pulled a stone under Moses, let him sit down, made him lower. They took his hands and they raised up his hands. You know, I bet they got under there and here, just prop it on my shoulder. And they raised his hands. And the whole time that his hands were raised, the Israelites were winning. Until sunset, it was that way. The Bible says, and the Israelites won a great victory that day because so many guys were willing to follow what God had to say. Joshua, Moses, Aaron, Hur. They were all lifting up one another. I'm going to encourage you to do this, guys. Lift up somebody's hand. <coughs> now, I know how this deal goes, okay? I know... When you're in school, it doesn't matter if you're in the first grade or the 15th grade. Okay? It, 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 you've got to, you got to treat everybody the same. Why? The Bible commands it. Now, there are certain, there are certain kids that just, uh, you just think, When I was in high school, I was trying so hard to fit in. I wanted to be cool. If I thought a guy walked cool, you know, I, I, I catch myself walking like that. I, you know, and I thought that was cool. And other people that were my friends, they what are you doing? <laughs> what? What? What are you doing? You walk like those so I do not. He walks like me. <laughs> you know, and just trying to fit in and trying to be cool. And there was a guy that, that rode our bus before I started driving to school. He rode our bus. Now check this out. This was so make fun of you of uh, Kind of, it just called for it. His name was Peter D. Montgomery. And on the bus, we would chat. Peter D. Peter D. Peter D. Montgomery. Peter D. Peter D. And everybody would shout it. And that dude would be sitting there, you know, and going, shut up. <laughs> All of Napoleon Dynamite is, shut up. <laughs> shut up. And we'd be all over, Peter D, Peter D, Peter D Montgomery. And one day, you know, in the middle of my coolness, Peter D Montgomery came up to me and he said, uh, he said, um, are you like interested in engines and stuff? It, like, you mean like Indians? No, engines, like, it, like car <laughs> engines. And, oh, no. <laughs> and he goes, I built my own mini bike. I took a Briggs and Stratton motor and I mounted it to a and I'm like, what? <laughs> I met a guy last night, I'm not going to tell you who he is, but we were talking about guns. I like guns. I like shooting things. It's, uh, it's really fun for me. And I said, oh yeah, man, I've got a stainless steel 40 caliber Taurus 24-7. You know. <laughs> yeah, <I'm cheating. laughs> And he said, oh, he said, I got, I got a Taurus 24-7 too. I got a Taurus 24-7 Pro. Dude. And he went to naming all, all his guns. And he said, I got an AR-15. Oh, <gasps> you do? I said, he said, yeah. And I made it myself. I'm like, dude, give me your cell number. We've got to talk. How'd you do that? He goes, yeah, you buy the parts. And I'm like, oh, man, we were crazy. We were like besties in a second, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he started telling me, you know, he said, yeah, you take the thing. And then he showed me a picture of it. I was in awe. He's got a six-year-old girl. He's got a video of her shooting that AR-15. 
I'm like, am I too old to marry your daughter? <laughs> you know, it's just cool. Now, when, you, when you do stuff like that, it's just, oh man. But when he was talking about the motor and mounting onto the bike, and then you put a sprocket back here at the back, and you, it's not a chain, you can do like a, um, like a fan belt type of deal or, or a belt that you use on a lawnmower, you know, and he said, he said, yeah, and it's and it's kind of primitive, but he said, I got this throttle deal that w the more pressure you do, ooh, ooh, you move that thing forward, I'm like, dude. He said, you want to see it? Oh, yeah, I want to see it. <laughs> and in a matter of about a week, when everybody was going, Peter D, Peter D, Peter D Montgomery, there were two guys standing up going, shut up. Oh. What's wrong, y'all? See, Peter D. had a friend. And I started lifting up his arms without realizing what I was doing. Peter D. Montgomery became my friend. It was amazing how that red-haired, freckle-faced boy that smelled like pee changed <laughs> in my eyes. He changed in my eyes. And when I, when I heard anybody talk about Peter D. Montgomery in a derogatory way, I was like, I will kick your butt. Do you understand? Peter D. is one of my friends. You don't even know him. I thought, oh, what's wrong with me? I'm becoming a nerd. <laughs> and the Lord said, you've been a nerd all along. <laughs> Oh, shoot, Lord, I thought I was cool. <laughs> but it's amazing how when God spoke to my heart about befriending Peter D. Montgomery, how God changed that guy in my eyes. And I didn't know it. I thought I was lifting up his hands, and he was lifting up my hands the whole time. See, we might need to do that. We're, let me say it this way. You know, we do need to do that. Wherever we are. My dad told me a long time ago, man, I, I remember this. I don't remember a lot of things that my father has said to me and some things I have chosen to forget, but some things, I can't get them out of there. They're like stuck in there like glue. And he said, son, you be nice to everybody because everybody is having a hard time. I want to tell you something. You can learn something from anybody. Yeah, you can learn something from a Georgia cowboy. Maybe not much, but something. There's going to be something that I say, it, it, you know, yesterday, today, tomorrow. There's going to be something that I say, or maybe a phrase in the song that I'm singing. There's going to be something to encourage you in your walk. Without knowing it, I raise your hands. That's what the body of Christ is all about. Now we have a different function. Not everybody can be as cool as the coolest person in this room. And uh, not everybody can be as athletic as the most athletic person in this room. And not everybody can be as smart as that guy that goes, um, I have worked on the equation, sir. And, and you're like, check this out. You know, M plus, uh, listen, I became a brilliant algebra person the second time I went through algebra one. <laughs> and either the teacher started liking me finally, or she was just like, I'm not bringing him back to third time. There's no way in this world. <laughs> but you may not be able to do everything that everybody else does, but God has given you a spirit and a heart. And, and first of all and foremost, we've got to put him in first place, and then we get about his business. You cannot pray and ask God to bless your deal. You can find out what God's got going on, and you can get in on it, and it changes everything. You start lifting up people's hands. Listen, it wasn't a spiritual problem for Moses. It was a physical problem. 
man alive. You know, I gotta tell you, I've seen the big bang theory a few times. And they talk about this guy, Stephen Hawking, you know. Yeah, a little thing to me about it. You were handy, you know, right? And and I'm thinking, isn't that something? The guy is a quadriplegic, and he is uh, He's got a brain that, that's amazing. He's a real guy, if he's still alive. He's a real dude. And I mean, he, he, when, when you ask him questions, he you know, kind of intimidates you a little bit because, boy, he would, he would fire that thing out. But you know what? I'm wondering, I bet that guy would be able to just, I, I bet he'd love to be able to just walk around. Even with bad knees, I bet he'd like to be me, physically, you know? Listen, there are seven people, this freaks me out, there are seven people in this world, probably close to you, that want to be just like you. Isn't that something? <laughs> Y'all are sitting there going, uh-oh, uh -oh. bad choice. Really bad choice to <laughs> But there are seven people that want to be just like you. You better start lifting up their hands. You better... Allow them to lift up your hands. God's got a place and a purpose and a plan for each one of us. And he wants us to be about his business. We don't have to pray and ask God to bless our business. We find out what he's doing. We get in on it. And that's how you honor God. He is so busy all around the world. Listen to me. God is not an American. He has got things going on all over the world. I got a text the other day. I don't know who this man is, but somebody from <laughs> India texted me, looked at our website and said, we would love for you to come and minister in India. You know, whatever. We got so many things. They had so many things under the umbrella of their ministry that were available, like street preaching and street evangelism. And I'm thinking, man, well, I, I can do that. Can you imagine what kind of ministry it would be if I just sort of stepped out in the middle of town and started turning that road? Those people are like, cowboy, cowboy, come, come, cowboy. You know. They have they want they want to see that right there. Why did God do that with me? Because He's given me a talent and 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 He and He produced that talent in me and I worked at it and I and I practiced it. And it's what, you know, people might be attracted to. Everybody, you know, growing up, you wanted to be three things. You either want to be a fireman, a cowboy, or a garbage man. <laughs> and why do you want to be a garbage man? So you could ride on the back of the truck and your mom would say, get off of there, mom, I'm working. Why, I believe you want. <laughs> Riding on the back of the truck. We're going over 35 miles an hour. I'm just holding on with one hand. Hey, hey, garbage man. <laughs> Um, I'll step off of here, throw your garbage away, and impress you hanging off the truck. Okay? <laughs> you see the point I'm making? When God's baked into you like a biscuit, He wants you to be about His business. Don't just cruise. Don't just kind of do what God wants you to do. Be all about it. Be all in. Get into Jesus with all four feet and get about His business. I'm encouraging you. You say, oh man, I'm young. You know, aren't, aren't there seventh graders in here? You know? No, I'm just a lowly seventh grader. I can't do nothing. Yeah, you got <laughs> Let me tell you something. If you're going to go through life, <laughs> if you're going to go through life with that attitude, there's a bunch of 12th graders here. Oh, I'm just a lonely senior. I have nowhere to go. I don't know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you don't know nothing because you're trying to get this done in your own power. Yield yourself fully to the call of Christ. Man, listen, you'll be so busy, so quick, it'll make your head spin. Ministry took off for me when I realized that I was nobody and God was everything and I was mesmerized that He'd be interested in using me. And he doesn't want 
my, uh, let me put it this way. I don't need to pray, God use me, because he's going to. I need to pray this way, you need to pray this way. God make me usable. He grabs you and takes off. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for who you are and who we are in you. I thank you for your patience. I thank you for your mercy. I can't thank you enough for your grace. Lord, I thank you that you're willing to use folks who don't think they have any abilities at all. Lord, and that's not what you want. You want availability. Lord, I see, I've, I've seen a lot of these kids in class, and I see it in their eyes, and they have a yearning to, to do certain things um, with their life. They, they already know they're, they're driven, and they're working on what they, what they want to become. And Lord, I'm encouraging every one of them to realize that whatever field they choose, Lord, that you are in that and on them for a reason. And they're a missionary, and they're going to carry the gospel of Jesus Christ wherever they go. Whatever they choose as their, uh, as their profession. Lord, they are to carry the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are a missionary. Thank you that you choose every one of us. And you, and you put the body of Christ together so we can build one another up and raise one another's hands and just be about your business. Work, reach the world for Jesus Christ. Well, we love you today. Thank you so much for these kids. I thank you for this school. I thank you for these teachers. Lord, I've been able to meet so many of these teachers, and I just, they, I am in awe of, of the talents that they have. Lord, thank you for loving us. We don't deserve it. We haven't done a thing to deserve it. But, uh, there are, there are two absolutes. There is a God, and we're not Him. <laughs> and I thank you so much that that God cares more about us than we care about ourselves, and that His dreams for us are bigger than our dreams. Thank you, Jesus, for, for dreaming big dreams for me. Precious name of Christ, we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a good day. Some of the classes I'm going to be kind of hanging with you a little bit this afternoon. I know.